Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So usually I analyze the quote-unquote progressive invasion of comic books and things surrounding that because it's a good microcosm that we can look at. There's good information. You can see these people talking and what exactly they mean on their podcast, yada, yada. So there's a whole lot of information there. But today I'm going to look at a separate piece of entertainment, something that does the exact same thing within a snapshot. And that snapshot is of the new D&D 5e rules for Ravenloft. And while I'm not familiar with the book itself, I am familiar with Ravenloft, and I'm certainly someone who is a big fan of the original source material that created these stories and books and games to begin with, which was Dracula, which was one of my favorite novels when I was growing up. And while I know this was technically published in 2021, most people are really getting to it now, and I think this is the time to go over it because, well, first of all, I've just been introduced to these rules, but the thing is that this is a set of rules, a set of prescripts by these quote-unquote progressive people, so it's exactly what they're trying to boil everything down to, and it's good to take a look at something like that. But if you want something which is classic D&D, classic low fantasy, classic barbarian swings a sword in a fantasy world of sword and sorcery, then you should check out my newest graphic novel, Crom the Destroyer. The link for it is in the description and on the pinned comment. The Indiegogo campaign, which is what the link is for, opened about six days ago, and we're about to smash through our second stretch goal, which is about $10,000. You're looking at some of the beautiful art from that graphic novel in the background, and the basic story is you have an undefeatable king who meets an unstoppable force, and then a battle of wills ensues. And if you want to know more about the story, the Indiegogo page has the first 11 pages of the book all lettered there for you to read. The book itself is a minimum 66 pages. And again, if you want to return to the core elements of low fantasy, click on that link in the description and go on over to Indiegogo and order yourself a copy of Krom the Destroyer. But back to my topic. What I'm going to do here is first read you a snippet from this book being the new 5e Ravenloft rulebook. Then I'm going to go into the authors and where they come from and what their background is just a little bit. Then we'll come back to these rules, see how they fit into the quote-unquote progressive nature of the people writing this book and where D&D &D is going, analyze that just a little bit, and then move on to talking about what I usually talk about, and that is A, how this destroys ideas of real heroism, and B, how it even destroys good storytelling. So I'll give you a picture in the background of the caption box, which is called Subvert Clichés. It says, when characters and worlds feature clichés, they become dull and predictable. If your favorite horror story features outdated tropes, your fondness doesn't redeem them. To create dynamic and compelling characters, consider the following options. Number one, avoid drawing inspiration from stock characters in fiction or film. Number two, treat characters as real people with motivations. Put yourself in their shoes. What would you do? Number three, show how multiple people from the same culture are different. Number four, feature members of different genders ethnicities, and sexualities, as well as people with disabilities and of varied beliefs as having broad roles, professions, interests, and outlooks. Endlessly work on quashing stereotypes. Number five, don't use cliché accents, especially to represent marginalized people. Number six, matter-of-factly, provide opportunities for everyone to be exceptional. Magical settings bear no resemblance to real-world history, and character creation rules presuppose no standard bar for heroics. And by the way, you'll note at the bottom of this, outside of the caption box, one of the things they do tell you to do is have foes play dead, only to return to life after characters think things are safe. And yet, they want you to subvert cliches. Anyway, I'm going to get back to these rules. Let's look at the authors and the people who came up with this to begin with. So the actual name of this book is Von Richen's Guide to Ravenloft. And it was published 
on May 18, 2021. The lead designer, Wesh Schneider, said that the goal was to move beyond the derivative tropes that have plagued the Ravenloft setting in the past, while also allowing players to engage with the material from a number of different perspectives. Now, this is from a Polygon article. I'll put the link for that in the description and probably put it up in the background for you as well. But it says, over the years, Ravenloft has been criticized as derivative and for reinforcing harmful stereotypes through its portrayal of Vashtanai, an in-fiction analog for the Roma people. Nevertheless, the adventure has proved to be wildly popular. Okay, let me just stop right there and say, it's wildly popular, and yet you have some people who are criticizing it as derivative and having harmful stereotypes. What do you think the percentage of those people actually are? My guess, and that's all it is, but my guess is they're a tiny percentage of the people who actually play this game or have any connection with this game. Why are you listening to this tiny percentage? Because obviously you're saying it's wildly popular, so most people don't really care about this. But again, those are the statements of the lead designer. Let's look now at some of the people who are working directly on this book. They would include Amanda Harmon, formerly of Cobalt Press, Cassandra Kashaw, Molly Ostertag, and Kay Tempest Bradford. Now let's go over to Wikipedia because that's an unbiased source, right? I actually like to use Wikipedia for these kinds of things because it is a heavily, quote unquote, progressive leaning source of information. Therefore, they're quite free with statements about how, quote unquote, progressive people are. So the first person on that list was Amanda Harmon. Now, if you look at her Wikipedia, it really doesn't say a lot about what she's actually done or any statements from her itself. But there is this connection to Cobalt Press. But before we look at that connection to Cobalt Press, let's go over to Amanda's Twitter page and see what's there. Well, you have her name, which is bracketed on both sides by your quote-unquote progressive rainbow flag, because it has much more colors than the original one. And she self-describes as the senior designer for Dungeons & Dragons, co-creator of the Starfinder RPG by Piazzo. And then she gives her pronouns, she, her, says she's bi, followed by that progressive rainbow flag again, and then hashtag Black Lives Matter. Now, for a second, I want to go over to Piazzo, which is where Dungeons & Dragons originally took her from, and see what kind of company this is. And I realize that the timeline is that Amanda left Piazzo before what I'm just about to say actually occurred, but it does give you some sense of what this company is all about. In 2022, Piazzo hired a woman called Maggie Gallagher as the Director of People and Culture. And it says right on their website, human resource veteran brings a passion for employee relations, diversity, equity, and belonging. And the president of Piazzo says, Maggie's experience and skill set are a perfect fit for Piazzo. And we think that her personality, her commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and her passion for strong relationships truly make her the right person for our company today. And this Maggie Gallagher woman, she says, While a true HR generalist, my passions are in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I have worked with numerous organizations in helping them implement diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and initiatives that advance organizational and cultural change by ensuring DEI considerations are incorporated in all aspects of the decision-making process. Note how her statements say that it's all about cultural change. That's important for the future of this video cultural change more than the product itself. So that's the woman that they hired as their DEI officer. And they said, she's the perfect fit. And again, I know this happens after Amanda leaves Piazzo, but at the same time, if this is the perfect fit for them one year after Amanda was there, what do you think Piazzo Entertainment is actually like when it comes to what kind of employees it wants? And again, I refer you back to Amanda's Twitter page, and I think you can understand where that's going. However, Amanda is just basically a designer. Let's look at some of the more intricate connections to the writing for this book. Let's look at Cassandra Kashaw. 
Now I know people in the comments are probably telling me that I can't pronounce names. I already know that. Don't really care. Now, if we go over to Cassandra's Wikipedia page, we don't see a whole lot about her. It's a very short little biography, and that's it. However, it does tag on there at the end of this short little bit that she uses they, them pronouns. And I'm sorry, but right here and now, I'll have to say, if you're someone whose stock and trade is words, which, as a writer, your stock and trade is words, you're trying to convey meaning through words, and you don't understand the basic fact that pronouns have certain meanings, and you can't just generally pick out your own pronouns to use, and expect everyone else to understand what they mean when they're reading a sentence and there is a pronoun stuck in there that doesn't belong. If you're someone who uses pronouns like this, you don't A, either understand the basic concepts of how the English language works, or B, you don't care about the basic precepts of how the English language works because they are trumped by your ideological bent. One or the other, you're not a good writer in that regard. I did go over to Twitter and see if she had a Twitter page. I didn't really find it, but I did find some of her writings. The most notable one of these would be a book that was listed last month, which was June, as Queer Books by Queer Authors. It's called The Salt Grows Heavily. The New York Times put that on one of their lists. I don't really care which because New York Times is a rag, but they stated it was basically The Little Mermaid meets Children of the Corn because it's a horror novel. So the basic plot is The Little Mermaid, which is a horrific creature because she's a mermaid and they're actually horrific, meets a non-binary doctor and then hijinks ensues wherein they meet up with a cult full of cannibalistic children. But that's about all I can bring out from Cassandra right at this point. I do believe that's enough, but let's move on. One of the other writers is Molly Knox Ostertag. She is noted for a webcomic called Strong Female Protagonist. And if you go over to Strong Female Protagonist, what's all that about? Well, it says the protagonist is a super strong ex-superhero who retired from her teenage role as Mega Girl, now 21. She is a college student who works for justice by attending protests and volunteering. And it says later on that this superhero is now focusing on social injustice and government intrusion into reproductive rights. She also wrote a book series called Witch Boy, which, by the way, was published by Scholastic, which means it's in all the schools being sold to most probably to middle grade or younger students. And it was lauded by CNN as being an important story about acceptance and love, wherein the witch boy has two dads, is described as not conforming to gender norms, and of course, there's the magical element to it as well. So again, this is being sold to your children in school. And oh, by the way, this woman also writes erotic comics as well. So maybe this is just me, but I don't know, I'm crazy, I guess. But I wouldn't want a woman who writes erotic stories to be writing children's stories that go into every classroom in the nation. But hey, that's just me. Also, this woman was nominated for a GLAAD award. Now, GLAAD is the organization for alphabet people, which basically feeds compiled disinformation to every structure that wants to believe what it has to say so that it bends the cultural narrative towards the alphabet people. In short, it purports to be objective when it is in no way, shape, or form objective. However, let's move on to the last writer on this list, K. Tempest Bradford. And without going too much into this woman's past or anything like that, let's just look at some of the articles, the nonfiction articles that she has written. They include Representation Matters, A Literary Call to Arms, Cultural Appropriation Is, In Fact, Indefensible, Invisible Bisexuality in Torchwood, Women Are Destroying Science Fiction, But That's Okay, They Created It, Why Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter Is the Ultimate White Guilt Fantasy, and Why Black and not African American. And if you scroll down to the Wikipedia part that talks about her awards, she's got an award for gentle advocacy, also another award for inclusivity and representational education, and two more awards for efforts in service of inclusion and equitable practices in the genre. Now, before moving back to Ravenloft, let me just point out a couple of little things here. Number one, 
for a group of people who are all about diversity, isn't there such diversity in this group of people? I mean, really, all four of them women, all four of them decidedly slanted towards one political ideology. Yeah, diversity all over the place there. Number two, for those comic-minded people who are listening to me all the time, yes, this does have some connection with comics. That woman who wrote Strong Female Protagonist has connections with Nick Spencer, you know, the guy who made Captain America a Nazi, because Nick Spencer started a substack for comics where he invited a certain core group of people, influential comic book people, to write comics with him on his substack. Guess what? This woman was one of them. So yeah, this kind of thing bleeds straight into comic books, in case you're wondering. And number three, this is a snapshot of the people who are in control of your D&D books right now. And you can understand why Dungeons & Dragons is being destroyed, if not completely destroyed by this point. And it doesn't really matter because according to Kay Tempest Bradford, which was one of those writers, and her article, Women are destroying science fiction, but that's okay because they created it. You see, women have ownership of this science fiction and fantasy. You don't have any ownership of it. They do, because they created it, therefore they can destroy it. It's all up to them. I think I might just do an entire video on that essay. All right, so let's get back into the Ravenloft manual itself. And yes, there is the jump in quality in my video because I changed locations. It begins with a text box that says, Subvert cliches. I could just spend all day talking about that. Subversion is the name of the game. For these quote-unquote progressive people, everything must be subverted. That is the end point of what they're trying to do. This all goes back to the origin of progressivism, which is critical theory, which is a Marxist interpretation of the world that says the world is made up of nothing but power dynamics, and in order to have the correct power dynamics actually come out on top, you need to destroy the bad ones, like capitalism. Through what? Well, through subversion. This is the whole point of the creation of critical theory itself, was to subvert Western culture to a point to take the legs out from under it by chipping away at it bit by bit so that it will eventually fall. And what do they mean by subvert cliches? They want to destroy cliches, so-called, but there are three words that they use in this text box to actually describe the same thing, even though they're not the same thing. They use the words cliché, trope, and stereotype. Now, if you go back to a good dictionary at least 20 to 30 years old, you'll find that cliché is simply a very predictable or unoriginal thing. A trope is a figurative or metaphorical use of a word or expression, and a stereotype is a preconceived and oversimplified idea of the character which typify a person or a thing. But within this little box, they try to use the three of them in an interchangeable way, as it were. But if you really get down to the heart of it, what are they describing with any of these three things? Well, they're describing a standard. Any standard that they don't have cultural control over. That's what you must subvert, and that's what you must also demonize. You'll notice at the very first it says, when characters and worlds feature cliches, they become dull and predictable. Well, yeah, that's the definition of a cliche, dull and predictable. So what? But they go on to say, if your favorite horror story features outdated tropes, your fondness doesn't redeem them. Now you see how they replaced cliche with tropes as if they were the same thing, but they're not. But they assume them to be the same thing because they're talking simply about the standard quality of each cliches, tropes, and stereotypes. They want that standard out of there. If you believe there is a standard and you have a fondness for it, it doesn't redeem it. Now, this is very important because it's using the word redeem. What does that mean? It means that you're using a trope, a standard, a cliche. That's something that should be demonized. That is something that is characterized as evil. It is not something that can be redeemed. On the other hand, they say, to create dynamic and compelling characters, consider the following options. Again, dynamic. Everything must be in flux. This goes back to the Nietzschean idea of dynamism, where there is no standard, where there's just a vortex of wheeling power around you, 
and you create something out of this vortex of whirling power because there is no standard. There is no cornerstone on which you can place anything. And so they begin. Avoid drawing inspiration from stock characters in fiction and film. Now this is supremely funny. Why? Because what the heck is Ravenloft to begin with? It is the derivation of the stories which are in both the movies and the books of Dracula and other characters that were portrayed by Boris Karloff. Quite literally, this is what the entire thing draws from. Even this book itself is Von Richstein's Guide to Ravenloft. Who's Von Richstein? Well, it's the D&D counterpart of who? Van Helsing from the Dracula books, quite specifically. Not to mention the fact that they're doing all this within the context of you being one of these Roma people that is a faux Roma people within the D&D setting, which comes from where? It comes from the Dracula books. And the other characters, again, are based upon Boris Karloff. I can't believe that they're trying to say, you can't draw inspiration from stock characters in fiction and film. That would make it cliched and hackneyed when the entire thing is based upon stock characters from fiction and film. So what are they trying to say there? They're trying to say, oh, well, if we don't have control over it, you can't do it. See, if you do it yourself, if you're the ones who are actually bringing this in from these other pieces of fiction or film, well, no, no, you can't do that. But we can do it. Yeah, we can do it. And why can they do it and you not? Well, because they have control over it. That's the point. The next bullet point, it goes on to say, Treat characters as real people with real motivations. Now that's an actual good piece of advice if they stopped there, but they don't. They continue on by saying, put yourself in their shoes. What would you do? So what does this mean? That means that real characters with real motivations are what? They're self-inserts. They're based upon your subjective interpretation of everything. It's about yourself in their shoes. What would you do? You see, it's not these are characters that have an independent existence within themselves, something objective. No, that's what actual storytelling is about. No, they want everything to be a self-insert. Everything is self-referential. Then they go on to say, show how multiple people from the same culture are different. And first of all, I have to ask this question. Who in the world would actually have to put this down on a piece of paper except for a quote-unquote progressive individual? Because the whole thing is that they're nothing but NPCs who cannot come up with an original thought. And they don't understand that, oh, guess what? Some cultures have different kinds of people. So either they themselves don't understand that, hey, guess what? Everybody's an individual, which really they don't understand individuality. The whole point of progressivism is collectivism. But really what this statement does, it points you to the next one. And the next one is... Feature members of different genders, ethnicities, and sexualities, as well as people with disabilities and various beliefs as having broad roles, professions, interests, and outlooks. Endlessly work to quash stereotypes. Again, here we have stereotypes. It is that substitute word for standards. Now, you have to break this one down just a little bit because they have it in two sections of this long sentence. And what this breaks down to is to substitute each of these words in the following way. They're saying different genders cannot have the same standard. They have to have varying beliefs, broad roles, professions, interests, and outlooks. And the same goes for each one of these. Ethnicities can't be used in a standard way. They need to have various beliefs, broad roles, profession, interests, and outlooks, etc., etc. Again, what are they saying here? They're saying there is no standard by which people actually exist. The stereotype is referencing, once again, what it says up top with the tropes, because they're being interchanged, and the tropes can't be redeemed. They're actually something evil. So is stereotypes here. So if you stereotype, if you give a standard for genders, like the fact that, oh, I don't know, women actually take care of the kids, well, sorry, but that's an evil way of thinking. You can't think that way. You think that ethnicities are actually homogenous when, by the way, a definition for ethnicities is that they are homogenous. It's baked right into how you define ethnicity. But no, they're saying it can't have a standard. No, no, it can't have a standard. 
The same with sexualities and people with disabilities. And I have to say, I'm sorry, but this is completely ridiculous. Having someone with disabilities in a country that is dominated by vampires and you're trying to make them into some kind of a hero, that really doesn't work. They're probably going to be the first one eaten. But really, the entire point of this statement is the very last part of it where it says, endlessly work to quash stereotypes, which again is just another way of saying subvert cliches, which is just another way of saying subvert and destroy any kind of a standard. You can't have a standard role for males and females. And by the way, genders, no. Male and female are the sexes. Gender is for words. You're supposed to be writers. And the word gender and its original origins that come from the old French back into the Greek, which goes to genus. You're putting each of these words in a category, a genus. Once again, I can't believe people who have their stock and trade in words and conveying meaning through words can't actually understand how the English language works. But again, I'll have to say, the point of this entire text box is really summed up in that statement. Endlessly work to quash stereotypes. Substitute stereotypes for standards. Endlessly work to quash standards. There can be no standard for anything. But moving on to the next one that says, don't use cliche accents, especially to represent marginalized people. How in the world can these people be marginalized if in this world you're going into a town where they make up the entire town? They're not marginalized people in this town. These quote unquote Roma people or these gypsies, which is what they are. They're a bunch of gypsies and they are the ones who make up this town, they're not marginalized if they're the predominant people by far of the area. But no, no. You see how this takes their world and inserts it into this fantasy world? Because they're marginalized people according to who? According to the people who are writing this. Not marginalized people according to the story itself. So you see how that political ideology just creeps right in there. And oh, by the way, you can't understand that People from different parts of the world with different languages actually use sounds in different ways because that's where accents actually come from. So if you're in a part of the world which is basically Eastern Europe and you're smack dab in the middle of a town of gypsies, yeah, they're gonna have an accent compared to you. But once again, that's the whole point. You see, the insertion, underlying insertion of the fact that they're marginalized people. So it's the insertion of their political ideology into this statement itself. And then it goes on to say, matter of factly provide opportunities for everyone to be exceptional. Magical settings bear no resemblance to real world history and character creation rules presuppose no standard bar for heroics. This is where we get into the thing that ticks me off the most, the heroics part, but I'll get to that. But once again, we see the progressive trope of the fact that everybody is special, everybody is exceptional, even though you've done nothing to actually be exceptional. This is the fantasy of their own world that they want to build, supposedly, being shoved right into this other fantasy world, saying magical settings bear no resemblance to real world history. And this goes back to the progressive idea that we're in this new phase of history. All the rest has been swept into the dustbin of history. We're beginning anew. None of that standard, none of that ethos of history actually means anything to us. And then it says, character creation rules presuppose no standard for heroics. I'm sorry, it presupposes no standard for heroics. So you're creating a character and you can make it into a hero even though there's absolutely nothing to describe it as a hero because a hero has no standard. Once again, subverting cliches there, which again is the destruction of what a hero actually is. In the real world, which they discount, the idea of a hero is someone who's heroic, someone who's virtuous, someone who does heroic things, is just, is temperate, is prudent, is courageous. But of course, See the fact that everybody can be exceptional and there's no actual standard that can define that you're exceptional and I'm not. No, no, we have to have equity where everybody is considered exactly the same. And so to presuppose or declare that this person is a hero because they've done actual heroic things, well, 
you know, that's problematic. Which brings us back to the beginning of this entire thing. All of these people are heavy progressives. They have the exact same way of viewing the world through the exact same lens of progressivism. It draws its origin from critical theory, which says you need to subvert standards of Western civilization so the people who actually want to be supported by Western civilization have no footing to defend themselves. And this entire thing is, you can't use, you see, avoid, don't use, isn't redeemable. All of these are saying, no, you see, all of these things that are standard, that you are depending upon culturally in any way, even if they're historical, no, you can't do that. You can't have a footing of history. You can't have a footing of cliches. You can't have a footing of standards. You can't have any kind of footing, even if it's language-wise. It even goes right down to the basics of language. It's attacking standards of any kind. And the only thing that is open to you as a standard to use if you follow their directions as the writers of this book is the cultural norms that have been supplied to you by progressivism. And in the end, we get into the fact that what they're trying to do here is to control how you actually create something. This, in its heart, is a story. It is the creation of a story. All D&D &D is. You have a dungeon master who creates a story and then allows the other people around the table to participate in this story and help flush it out in certain ways through standards and norms and rules and mathematics. And this entire thing is destroying the heart of the Western idea of storytelling for a minimum 3,000 years right now. As I always do, I go back to Aristotle in the 4th century BC, who's describing storytelling using stories that are minimum 800 years older than him. That is to say, going back to the 1200s BC. And what does he do? He talks about storytelling as being both a representation of reality and a rhetorical argument. And this is how storytelling has continued throughout Western civilization for thousands of years. And it is one of the pillars that helps support Western civilization. But again, here's the point. That representation of reality, that rhetorical argument, they're all strict standards by which storytelling exists, and this is what they're trying to destroy with their subvert cliches. Because even with the Greeks, who are always concerned with what's new, that's actually one of the ancient Greek greetings, tainuturon, what's new, even with these people, People who, according to Aristotle, yeah, at the end of your story, the best way to do a resolution of the story is to have a bit of a subversion there at the end, which is to say, your mind of your reader or watcher or anybody else who's interacting with the story is going in one direction, and then something happens near the end which gives you a reveal, and all of a sudden everything is thrown up into confusion, and you have something that's going to attract your audience. But the point being that everything that leads up to that, according to the standards of Western civilization storytelling, which again, Aristotle talks about, are based upon reason and reality. Which, guess what? They're standards. Even if you just look at it according to it being a rhetorical argument, this is what people don't really understand. I get people in my comments saying, oh, you're just going back to an argument from authority. No, I'm a storyteller. I've never purported to be anything other than a storyteller. As a storyteller, I'm giving you a rhetorical argument, which means that I assume that my audience understands some basis in where I'm coming from, so I don't have to go back to first principles every time I say something. This is the same basis of storytelling. Storytelling assumes that you, as part of the human race, have some connection to reality, and you understand some of these things about reality that actually work and play out everywhere, every time, the exact same way, and so it doesn't need to be explained to you, and so what you begin your story with? You begin your story with cliches. You begin your story with stereotypes, with tropes. You use language in this way and then build upon that in order to flush out your characters and the situation. Especially if you're dealing with what we're dealing with here, which is pop culture. You have an audience of people who are looking for pure entertainment. For the most part. 
Not completely, but for the most part, they're going to switch off their minds and saying, I just want to be entertained. Don't make me think about this too much. Just entertain me. So what do you have to begin with? You have to begin with cliches and tropes and stereotypes, which again is the standard for Western civilization and actual writing. I get these people in my comments saying, your characters in your books are so derivative. Why don't you do something actually creative? Do you not? understand, I'm talking to these people who leave these comments, that every comic book character is a derivation of a character that has come before. Captain America is a ripoff of The Shield. Superman is a ripoff of Doc Savage. Spider-Man is a ripoff of Superman. The Fantastic Four are a ripoff of the Challengers of the Unknown. Every last character begins as a derivation of something else and then expands into an actual character on its own by what? By giving that character its own motivations, not putting yourself in there as a self-insert, which is what they tell you to do here. But the whole thing depends upon this subversion of standards. While at the same time they're telling you you can't do this, they themselves are doing the exact same thing they tell you not to do. Which means what? Either A, they're incredibly stupid, or B, it's rules for thee and not for me. You see, again, that's the point. The point is, they're in control. You're not allowed to have any standards that you yourself can actually set anything upon, except for your self-referential, subjective way of thinking. Which, by the way, as I always say, go right back to Plato and his laws, and he says this is the greatest evil that man can participate in to value himself above what is true. But yeah, that's the only standard that you're allowed to have for yourself, is a self-referential standard that has no connection to reality, to history, to literature, to language, anything that you can say has a standard according to how reality actually works. Why? Because in their minds, everything is cultural power dynamics, and they control the culture. All right, so if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this, and don't forget, if you want some old-school D&D sword and sorcery, low fantasy stories, head on over to my graphic novel, Crom the Destroyer. The link is in the description. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.